So there's no rules yet, but soon there will be, because we need to figure out, first and foremost, are we going to have a male character or a female character? And there's a 10% chance on this percentile I'm going to roll that it is a multi-classed character. Uh, Cookie, the act, the playing of D and D, the 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 dice rolling for casting spells and making attacks and all that happens on Tuesdays. For the other days of the week, we run a workshop that explains how things work. We answer questions. Um, you know, we'll make maps. We'll discuss uh, geography, uh, culture, stuff like that. Well, Trefus, I'll I'll tell you what. Um, if you need some help building that character, when we finish uh, when we finish the randoms here this evening, if you still have time, uh, we can build this character on stream together. So here's the percentile. Let's roll it. A 43, that's going to be a female character. Now, as you can see, there are nine races in the player's handbook. So I'm going to roll a d10. And um, we'll re-roll the 10 if we get it. Five. We have a Dragonborn. All right. Now, Dragonborns, you have uh, an interesting variety of them. In fact, we have this, this whole other uh, section over here in the character building work, uh, worksheet for them to determine are they chromatic or metallic, and then which, which origin of them are they. So let's roll a d6 to find out um, where we are here. One. So it's either going to be a red or a gold dragon. Odds, uh, so I'm going to roll a d6 again. Odds is chromatic. Evens is metallic. Evens. So we have a female gold dragonborn who are medium-sized. There we go, that was easy. Now, let's figure out her alignment. I'm going to do that by rolling two percentile die. One for each of the axes of the alignment chart. Uh, Dun James says, Me and my mates are playing as a cult who want to end the world by ascending to godhood and create a new world from ashes. Well, uh, that that breaks the mold, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. That breaks the mold of you know what may, many may consider to be a standard D and D campaign. Um, I guess if we were to boil it down, it sounds like a quote unquote evil campaign, but that doesn't mean you have to. I mean, you might end up you know kicking puppies and burning down orphanages in your in your cult quest, but um, it, it's certainly out of the norm. Um, so. A lot of this is going to be, um, you know, if your DM is on board with this idea, you'll probably have a, kind of a smooth time of it. I imagine your DM is going to challenge you because, look, a lot of people don't want the world to end. Uh, so you might face challenges there. But how do you overcome them? You know, not all stories are about the good guys rescuing the princess from the dragon kind of a thing. All right, we're going to roll two percentiles here. 89 and 42. Well, speaking of evil, uh, we have a neutral evil character for our first one. Now, for those of you who are newer to D&D, &D, there's an alignment chart. Uh, one axis measures if you're good, neutral, or evil. The other axis measures if you're chaotic, neutral or lawful those are very basic ways to describe one's personality i would urge you that you know even if you're playing an evil character kind of like what i talked about with uh dun james up here just because you're an evil character doesn't mean you have to kick puppies and burn down orphanages evil in this case is going to be more like you're more selfish or self-centered for example, with James's campaign idea, his cult wants to ascend to power. They want the power for themselves. So they are going to act in selfish ways and, and in order to accumulate what they want. 
whereas good, quote unquote, tends to be more selfless. Just as well, you can you can find lawfulness and uh, chaotic, not just as in like, oh, I'm holding up the spork of doom, I, I'm a penguin, lol, random. Um, that's not necessarily chaotic. Chaotic can be, are you are you whimsical or impulsive, as your as your demeanor? I mean, you can almost look at this in World of Darkness terms, like nature and demeanor. Um, are you impulsive? Or are you methodical? Methodical people tend to be lawful, right? They they have a method of doing things. Um, and that is... It's not as storybook a term such as good or evil that you'll find, but those are the concepts to consider for the characters that you play. Oh, yes, that's true, Fluffy Sheep. Um, yeah, so Dun James, uh, all the other bad guys in the world who want to end the world themselves are going to be going up against you too, because, uh, suddenly it's an arms race, uh, to find out who can stop you or who can do it first. Yes, yeah, speak of the devil, he and he shall appear. Cookie, uh, you could be a good character, but not realize you're doing something that negatively affects people. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not always black and white, Cookie. In fact, you could come from, you know, imagine some whatever fantasy world that you generate. And what you do is perfectly normal and culturally acceptable. You go one kingdom over and suddenly you are a lewd degenerate or you are a monster because of, you know, because you eat meat. And you're like, but we all eat meat in this kingdom. Yeah, well, we're the vegetarian kingdom and we think that you're a monster and should be in jail. And you're like, whoa, dudes, okay, hang on. Hey, what's the matter, you, huh? Yeah, so, so <laughs> Lel, I'm so random. <laughs> uh, Derek Caddick is ultimately valuing freedom and self-expression over being concerned with the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. That's a very good uh, other explanation. All right, so we have a neutral evil character. This does mean that if we roll a cleric or a paladin, it's going to unlock some extra goodies that you, you quote-unquote, don't normally get from the player's handbook. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to this as we need to. Now, what level is she going to be? I'm going to roll a percentile die, and we're going to find out. Uh, let's see, we rolled a three, so she is going to be level four. She's, she's just the Diet Coke of evil right now. But I don't know. Uh, we can spin a tale for her that's going to take her into uh, wonderful things. All right. As she is level four, in the character creation process, we are going to get to give her one ability score improvement, also known as an ASI or a stat bump. In Dungeons & Dragons, if your DM allows you to take feats you can replace a stat bump with a feat that allows you to specialize in something. So what I'm going to do is roll a percentile die, and I'm going to find out, are we going to just ta uh, take the stat bump, or are we going to give her a feat of some kind? At 65, we are just at the stat bump. Now, we're going to come down here and we're going to generate a 13-sided die. Why 13 sides? Well, there are 13 different backgrounds in the player's handbook. And you'll notice we haven't rolled up her class yet. And that's purposeful. In, especially in D&D 5th edition, your character sits atop a three-legged stool of your race, your class, and also your background. Your background describes what did you do before you were an adventurer, right? What was your summer job? How did you grow up? Uh, do you have any useful skills besides swinging an axe? And so I want to challenge us to consider the background because that's what you do before you end up taking up your class, arguably. Let's roll a 13-sided die and figure out what background she is. Two. Two. She is going to be a charlatan. Now, charlatans have six different um, 
have six different cons or their their preferred tricks to play on people. They're scams, I'm sorry. I'm going to roll a d6 and we are going to figure out which one she is good at doing. Five. Okay. I run sleight of hand cons on street corners. So she's, uh, you know, she could be like a street magician. She's the three card Monty uh, dealer. She is, um, uh, she might even uh, be a, a pickpocket of, uh, of a type. Uh, Cookie, I will, we'll get defeats. Uh, even though we're not going to give her one, I will show you what they are in that process. Now, as part of your background, you are also going to get two personality traits, represented by 2d8. So, let's come down here. Two and seven. Now, I'm not really worried about what about what they do. In fact, I, I don't want I don't want us to get too far ahead. I'm going to go back to the generic uh, chapter four here. Okay. Um. We we're just figuring out numbers. They're placeholders. Her personality traits are two and seven, and now we're going to roll three d six. One die for her b ideal, one for bond, and one for flaw. Five, two, six. Okay, there we go. What do they mean? Again, don't worry about it right now. We'll get to it in a second. We need to finish fleshing out the character. Let's scroll back up. And now, now let's talk class. There are 12 classes in the player's handbook. And from them, there are uh, there are several different archetypes or like specialties that you can go into. I'm going to hit this big golden button up here, this D12 on the dice roller, to find out which class she is going to be. Nine. She is going to be a rogue. All right. Rogues have three different archetypes that they can be in the course of playing the game. You can be a thief, which is you, you are specializing in being a thief. You... Um, you can do a lot of, you know, physical tricks. You can run, jump, uh, steal things, use items in creative fashion. You can be an assassin. And that that allows you uh, some combat benefits um, because you're very good at uh, striking fast and hard. Or you can be an arcane trickster. In other words, you're a rogue that gets to, uh, get, that gets to dabble in a little bit of magic. Uh, so you'll get some spells that you can use to perhaps distract people or, um, well, use creatively as you will because you're an arcane trickster. I'm going to roll a three-sided die here, and let's find out what we'll, what we'll get. One. All right, so she is going to be a straight-up thief. What does that mean right now? Again, we'll get to it. Let's slot in our, our guides first. Now, as a dragonborn, let's figure out her physical dimensions, right? We've we've been we're coalescing we're coalescing a silhouette. We're we're pulling this character out of nothingness from the void or the aether or whatever you want to consider it to be. Let's give her some physicality. Dragonborn start at 5 feet 6 inches tall, and we're going to add 2d8 inches to her height. Alright, so we're going to add 15 inches to her height. So that's going to put her at 6'6", six, six, that's going to put her at 6 foot 9 inches tall. Uh, she is a tall girl. Okay. Now, this same 15 that we rolled for height is going to help modify her weight, right? I mean, as you grow up, you also can grow out. If we look here, we're going to roll 2d6, multiply it by 15, 
and then add that to her base weight of 175 pounds. And this is going to help us figure out her th her, dimen her uh, dimensions. Five. All right. So we're going to add 75 pounds to 175. So she is going to weigh 250 pounds and stand at six feet, nine inches tall. Now, lastly, the, the last bit of random number generation we're going to do is how old is our character? I include this because a lot of us, when we play D&D, &D, we, you know, we often think, well, let's be the youthful, bright-eyed adventurers, you know. Maybe we're like the, the scrappy anime protagonist, you know, we're like 14, 15, you know. We're going to challenge the system and bring down the bad guy as, as young, peppy people. Or maybe, you know, we're, in the, the, we're a young adults, uh, you know, we've already come of age, but now we need to prove ourselves to society uh, to earn our adulthood. Um, and so I include all stages of life here, right? A child prodigy, young adult, adult, middle-aged, old, venerable, or ancient. Because many of us, um, yeah, Derek, uh, many of us don't consider, have you ever tried running an old character? You know, think of the same character that, uh, that we have generated so far. And how, how would her story be different or how would you play her differently if we rolled her as a young adult or as someone who is probably going to be naturally, you know, dying of natural causes in the next five years? Would that impact your play style? Would that impact how you role play? And so I want to keep us open minded to the fact that we can have older characters or we can have a child prodigy as well. And that's fine. So once more, we're going to return to the percentile die, and we're going to roll it to find out where in the life cycle she is. 75. All right, so she is middle-aged. And for a middle-aged character, or for a dragonborn here, right? middle age is column four. So let's look at column four right here. Go over to Dragonborn, and we kind of cross-reference it, and bing, 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 bing. We're between 51 and 65 years old. So now I'm going to generate a 15-sided die and roll it. One. Okay. She's just starting her middle age. She's 51 years old. If you're playing at home or in a campaign... Do you have to randomly generate, you know, all this stuff? Not necessarily. I don't think your DM would force you to do so. I don't know. Some might want you to do it randomly. Um, but oftentimes you might have a character concept already in mind. And you, you want to play a young adult. And there's nothing wrong with that. You want to play someone who's, you know, more of a short stack uh, than, than a, a, a tall person. That's fine too. But we do this to challenge ourselves and to demonstrate how things work. And, um, and again, too, you, you might have had this optimal image, right, as we're building our character one step at a time. And suddenly, when we get to height and weight or age, I have just challenged your total perception of who this character is and was. And I rock your boat a little bit because that's going to help you be a lot more creative and to think more on the fly. All right, so congratulations. We have a very basic character. Um, now we are going to, uh, you know, we, we've cast our lot, you know, uh, into the, into the augury dish and let's read what the results mean. Like we've already read what a charlatan number five is. Uh, she runs sleight of hand cons on a street corner. Um, that's, that is fine and dandy and all, but now let's delve deeper. Let's find out who she is beyond just describing her as neutral evil. Cause that doesn't do any good. It just shows that she's she looks out for herself more often than other people. If we come down here to Charlatan, right? All the backgrounds are listed alphabetically in Chapter 4. Let's discover her personality traits and tell the story of this character. Who is she? Where has she been? What has she done? Why does she think the way that she does? 
as a little secret, this is the true character building. The stats? Eh. <laughs> Alright, personality trait number two. I have a joke for every occasion. Especially occasions where humor is inappropriate. So, uh, you know, she'll... She's the type to go to a funeral and and be like, oh, I'm glad I'm not him. Or, you know, she'll... Th there's a big party going on in the face of, uh, I don't know, in the face of... Uh, or, you know, something like a... I don't know, like a, an Irish wake, uh, you know, where everyone's drinking, having a good time around a deceased one. And she just cracks a joke that is still inappropriate, even in that circumstance. Um, she's the she's the type who'd probably ask you to pull her finger in an elevator and actually fart. Um... You know, it, it, the specifics are going to be up to, you know, the player of this character. Um, but this this is a basic tenet of her personality. She's a jokester. She loves, uh, and she loves humor, even if it seems inappropriate. She probably does tell bad puns, Sandsfire. Hey, Zoller P, or Zoller Pie, I'm sorry. Uh, I find these explanations fascinating. Oh, thank you very much. It's good to see you back here again. Now, her second personality trait was number seven. I keep multiple holy symbols on me and invoke whatever deity might come in useful at any given moment. That can also help for pulling off cons, too, right? Oh, hey, you know, you see someone walking down with, a, you know, uh, some declared allegiance on a piece of jewelry, and you kind of, like, quickly, like, flip through your keychain, and you're like, click. Oh, brother! Good to see you. How's things at Temple? <laughs> um, for a good example of this, if any of you saw the, um, the mummy, uh, the one with um, Brendan Fraser... The first one. Do you remember the character? Um, what was his name? Uh, Lenny, I think, was the character. Uh, he was one of the people who was helping in the dig. And when he was confronted by Imhotep the mummy, he uh, he was trying to like ward it off uh, by with different holy symbols. And so he brought out kind of like a little keychain. And so like he spoke Chinese as he held out a yin yang or something, you know, and then he tried, uh, he tried invoking, uh, I think like a Muslim prayer. And finally he got to the star of David and he invoked uh, a Jewish prayer and emo in emo says, Oh, the language of the slaves, I could use your help. And that saved his life. <laughs> Will Grandma be going to a better place now that she's dead? Of course she will, honey. There you go. King's in the spirit of things. <laughs> you, you see what I see what I did there? Okay. All right. Next up, what is her ideal? What what is she striving for? If she had her cake and could eat it too. Number five. Friendship. Material goods come and go. Bonds of friendship last forever. And you may say, okay, hang on, Matt. Or you must be cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. It clearly says good in parentheses after that ideal. And that's perfectly fine. This is one... Uh, her alignment is one aspect of her personality. Her bond or her ideal is another. She may view friendship differently than other people, but she still values friendship. She may try and earn your friendship differently, but she still wants your friendship. Does that make sense? Don't be, don't be suckered into just the alignment and everything has to fit uh, very neatly. Challenge yourself. Square that circle. How can you make a good ideal, a quote-unquote good ideal, fit on a neutral evil character? It is completely possible to do, and it's not that difficult. Oh, Derek says, King, mark the day. You made me crack a smile. Oh. <laughs> Her bond is two. I owe everything to my mentor... A horrible person 
who's probably rotting in jail somewhere. So she was brought up to be a thief and a charlatan by this mentor. And, um, you know, think of um, the character... I, I've invoked it before, but maybe it didn't fit because a couple people were saying otherwise. But if you know the the uh, the character Fagin, who had all of the... Uh, who was, like, training all the orphans to, like, you know, pick pockets and beg and bring the money back and whatnot, it could be a mentor like that. Um, or it could be, you know what... Maybe this, uh, maybe this mentor was someone who was actually uh, very strict and controlling, and uh, and uh, though you know that was the public face, but maybe in private, um, maybe in private he actually you know would insult her or bully her or, um, depending on the context of your game, this is. It's okay in role play to bring up you know crime. Politics, religion, sex, you know, if the context is there, but maybe, maybe her mentor actually, uh, you know, abused her in some way. And so she's actually happy that, uh, that he's in jail and after living, uh, and after living all these years under his or her, uh, you know, rule or abuse, um, she's now striking out and maybe, maybe, She's neutral evil, quote unquote, because she's finally free in the world. She's going to be her own, you know, dadgum person. And she is going to experience life uh, out of the oppressive, you know, from under the oppressive thumb of this mentor as they're rotting in jail. Or not. It doesn't even have to be that. But have, have I been able to help open your mind to possibilities? Maybe to have you consider things? I've never considered that as a as how my character came to be who he or she was. Hey, Ninbins! Uh, so an all-over twisted character. Oh! Hey, Pi! Good pun! Oh, that's a good one. I should, uh... I should talk to my mods about awarding puns with a little bit of uh, fun extra experience points. Uh, Ninbins, uh, Fagin was very strict and controlling. His manipulation was a little more sinister in that he convinced his young charges that they'd be nothing without him. In my experience, that's how I've experienced that character. And, and yeah, that might be the case. And now, you know what? She's striking out and she says, no, I am my own person. I will break into a, you know, I'll break in. I don't need you to tell me to break into a store and steal. I'll do it myself. I don't need your control. <laughs> Derek. <laughs> you got to make sure you do the, uh, you, you, you got to make sure like you, you, you do the hand signals, you know, like you, like you point and you're making the, yeah. All right. And finally her flaw, because we are all flawed creatures, players and PCs alike. What is her flaw? It's number six. I hate to admit it and will hate myself for it, but I'll run and preserve my own hide if the going gets tough. Now, maybe she does this physically, or maybe you manifest it as she's paralyzed by fear. Maybe she collapses and wets herself. Maybe she, uh, maybe because she has this as a flaw, she actually tries to avoid danger or what she would, whatever she'd classify as danger. So it's not even reactive, it's proactive. But it can be reactive. How, how would you want to interpret that flaw for that character? If this was your character you're playing, use this as a guide stone. Use it as, you know, a, a, a pillar and, and, you know, find some way or, or some way around or take the core concept and massage it a little bit into something that you think would be fun and playable. Derek died a little inside typing that. Sandsfire says she could have been the one to put it. Yes, yeah, she she very well could have been the one. Maybe that's uh, that was her first big heist or breakout, right? Um, she set her own mentor up to fail in some way. <clears throat> Very creative. Good ideas. All right. Now, 
we have a character. You see all this empty space up here? Yeah, this will get filled in. Hit points, you know, what weapons you use, etc. Whatever. You see right here? This is the character of your character sheet. Right here. I mean, especially if you want to put in your, your backstory, or you want to put in a character portrait, things like that. But these boxes here are your character. Do her stats really even matter at this point, now that we know a little bit about her and her story? Can we imagine her, uh, you know, just by describing her as a thief? Have we already started taking her on adventures up in here in this theater? Does it matter if her, if her strength scores a 13 or a 14 if you imagine her using a crowbar breaking into um, a shop's back door or, you know, you know, kind of having that silhouette against the full moon as she's jumping roof, rooftop to rooftop? Um, no. And that's the heart and spirit of the character. Now, we will get down to, well, the ability scores, you know, the brass tacks, because we're building a chassis for the character right now. We're building the body. We're giving it, you know, paint and curves and aerodynamics and tires and all this other stuff. The abilities are going to be the last thing or almost the last thing that we're going to put in this character. Because they're not necessarily relevant. The, the abilities will come because of who she is. And so that's the engine that we drop in the otherwise completed vehicle of the character. All right. Uh, a couple more things that our background gives us. Look up here. There's a little bit of thematic text. If you have a PHB, I'd suggest reading it. It's a good prompt. It doesn't have to define your charlatan, but it does describe a charlatan or the state of charlatanhood or charlataness. Mechanically, this background is going to give us proficiencies in deception. So we're going to fill in the little dot here. You see that little black dot I just put in? Uh, we're going to get uh, deception and sleight of hand. Sleight of hand is, um, you know, manual dexterity, pickpocketing, card tricks, um, you know, make the coin disappear, uh, you know, that th those kinds of things. Maybe even like a distraction technique of like, hey, hey, over here. And did you just look? Because while you were just looking at my snapping finger, my other hand came in from the side and, you know, y you get what I'm saying? Know what I mean? Tool proficiencies. A disguise kit, or a these guys kit, and a forgery kit. So down here in tools, we're going to type in a disguise kit. So she knows how to apply makeup better than a normal person. Perfumes, wigs, fake mustaches, um, which is would be very interesting on a Dragonborn. Same with earrings. <laughs> a disguise kit and a forgery kit. So she is good at, at using tools of those trades. Equipment. So down here in our backpack, we're going to give her a set of fine clothes. She's treating herself after what she's been through. Uh, she's going to get a disguise kit. Uh, tools of the con of your choice. So she, she runs sleight of hand tricks on the corner. So this would probably be something like um, a deck of cards. Maybe even marked cards. And a belt pouch with 15 gold pieces in it. Woohoo! Crime pays. Sans, uh, fancy card trick and now your coin. Yep, exactly. You, you know it. And even if she doesn't pick your pocket, she might just use sleight of hand to always track a marked card and just bilk you out of your gambling with her. Ninbins, I made one of my players roll a sleight of hand to see how well uh, he could handle a lasso. Oh, yeah. So, right, it's all in the wrist. And then, boo, you throw it, which is kind of a ranged attack, which is dex-based anyway. Ninbins, I like that. That's very creative.
Now we're going to get something called a background feature. Background features are... Mm, somewhat passive support abilities that your character uh, offers uh, him or herself and to the rest of the party. Um, it's, it's a way, it's a mechanical bridge to interact with the game or to take care of some background processes so that you may not always have to worry about the minutia of things. So we get a false identity. You have created a second identity that includes documentation, established acquaintances, and disguises that allow you to assume that persona. Additionally, you can forge documents, including official papers and personal letters, as long as you have seen an example of the kind of document or the handwriting you are trying to copy. So what I want you all to do out there in, uh, in chat, I want you to consider, as we're building this character, what would her false identity be? What is this secondary character or alter ego? Um, and you know what? She's not a human, so you can't just plop on some pointy ears and pretend to be an elf. Um, you know, you can't just... Uh, you, you really just can't even put on a mustache or a wig. Um, at least, you know, not magically. We're talking mundane. Uh, so, think about this. Challenge yourself. We know who she is, right? With, with everything we've discovered. As she is acting as her false identity, is she a goody two-shoes, you know, you know, a, a goody two-shoes like, oh, I'm helping the world. And, you know, and so she operates under some, you know, disguise of being, uh, you know, a saint. Um, maybe, maybe her, her thief self is in it for the adventure, but her false identity in order to try and prove herself to other criminals is... She pretends to be a thug, a murderer. She pretends to be this, you know, hard ass, um, unrepentant, whatever. Uh, her false identity can be many different things. And so I want you to think, what would be a good false identity for her to be? King says, I tried to think of a Sailor Moon pun, but then I just realized that without all the magical nonsense going on, that Sailor Moon is about a squad of Japanese legal vigilantes fighting quote-unquote ladies of the night and the main character fights with her quote-unquote moon and tuxedo mask shows up to distract people with his quote-unquote rose i'm going to bleach my brain now and uh, derek it's too late with all the holy items maybe her false identity is a cleric hey there we go use what we have exactly dark wolf um if that's what she keeps on her maybe maybe her her false identity is as a um you know a wandering holy person King holds up a finger to Derek while vigorously chugging bleach. <laughs> uh, Sans, you think she runs a bakery? Okay, that uh, that could be as well. Uh, what what would be your support? What's making you think that she runs a bakery? And I'm not challenge. I'm not saying that to to say that that's a bad idea. I want to know what caused the idea. Let's think out loud with each other, just as as King is thinking out loud and paying the the consequences for doing so, voluntarily. Although, in all honesty, Derek, it's not really a punishment. He's just bleaching his bones because he's a lich. So he's actually, you know, it's not as bad as it seems. It's really just making a puddle on the floor and maybe maybe he needs to get some new robes because they have a big bleach stain in them. It's the old, uh, it's the old joke of a skeleton walks into a bar. He orders a beer and a mop. Hey. DDMs. Oh, King is only dreaming of being a lich. So is he just? Uh, is he just as uh, as one of the guys from D and D time put it? He's actually just a normal skeleton that's wearing a robe to look impressive. All right. Excellent. We have we have a character. Now let's add a little bit more crunch to her, right? Fluff is personality, backstory, storytelling. It's all fluffy goodness. That's important to the game. Now let's add crunch, mechanics, things like that, uh, like defined abilities.
To do that, we're going to come back over here and visit. What do you get by virtue of being a Dragonborn? Here, for old time's sake. <laughs> I know I'm blocking chat a bit, but uh, th this was something that was going for a little while in chat. All right. Your strength score increases by two and your charisma increases by one. So we're going to put some placeholders down here. And what this means is Dragonborn are just naturally prone to having higher strength and charisma. That doesn't mean you can, you know, you could make strength a dump stat. But they'll just have a little, it won't be as dumpy compared to other races. Age, alignment, size, we already have that speed. Our run speed is 30 feet. That is going to give us a 15-foot climb and a 15-foot swim because those activities are half your normal speed unless something else provides otherwise. And the ability to fly, eh, we don't have it naturally, so we have a zero fly speed. Excellent. Moving on. We have our Draconic Ancestry. And there's a box here that's going to tell us what, what do we get by virtue of being, well, in this case, a gold dragon. Uh, choose one type of dragon from the Draconic Ancestry table. Your breath weapon and damage resistance are determined by that uh, dragon type. We are going to get fire resistance. If you look here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. You see right here, damage, immunities, resistances, and vulnerabilities. This sheet is nice because you can fill in these, uh, these dots. Blue, yellow, red, etc. For fire, necrotic, lightning, bludgeoning. So here, she's going to be resistant to fire because that's what she breathes. That's her heritage. She's also going to be able to speak the common tongue and draconic. She will also be getting, uh, as a racial feature here, a breath weapon. You can use your action to exhale destructive energy. Your draconic ancestry determines the size, shape, and damage type of the exhalation. When you use your breath weapon, each creature in the area of exhalation must make a saving throw, the type of which is determined by your draconic ancestry. The DC for this saving throw equals 8 plus your con mod plus proficiency. Don't let that formula make y'all googly-eyed. We'll get to it. Hang on. Um, a creature takes 2d6 damage on a failed save and half as much on a successful one. And that damage increases as our level does, but for right now it's going to be the basic 2d6. As a gold dragon over here, we are going to have a 15-foot uh, cone of 2d6 fire. Uh, this is a deck save. Deck save. DC for half damage. All right, so the question marks means that we're going to come back and fill that in once we can generate that. Uh, Ninbin says she could pick up the racial feat depending the one that gives her wings. Uh, yes, if we're including the splat books, that is the case, Ninbins, but as we're sticking to the core three... Uh, it's an option, and I'm glad that you brought it up, because there is content beyond the player's handbook that you can use um, if your DM allows it. Trefus, but what if she wasn't resistant to fire, so every time she breathed, it did damage to her? That could be a very interesting character concept. Uh, Trefus, if you brought that to the table and you said, well, look, um, you know, DM, I want to play... Hey, Laws, good to see you again. Uh, I want to play this character, but I... Maybe I was of mixed heritage. And so actually, I have, um, I don't know, I have green and gold in me. And so your, your DM says, okay, that's fine. I will give you poison resistance. But when you breathe your fire, um, you will take half damage from it. 
or something along those lines. Or you have to save in some way. I, I don't know. You have to save against your own effect uh, in order to, to get half damage. And that could be fine. That's that's very creative. And so that could allow you... Maybe you have a Dragonborn that's not just all gold scales, but maybe, if this was your character, she has, like, gold scales with green stripes or splotches on her. Something like that. You know, it's out of the, it's out of the norm. And for the... You know, you're getting the benefit of being able to surprise people because someone's like, oh, you know, a tiefling walks up and is like, what are you going to do, breathe fire on me? And then you squint your eyes and you say, yes. I don't know where that was going, but you could be all dramatic about it. <laughs> no, but you, you could you could fool people uh, that way. Um, or as the tiefling rogue goes to strike back and is like, aha, well, you know, I'm not going to use fire on you because you're a gold dragon. Here, taste my poison blade. And then you take the dagger and you just go, mmm, that was a good poison blade. And nothing happens. You know, you're not choking or spitting up or frothing at the mouth. Uh, that tiefling rogue probably, you know, pees himself a little bit and reconsiders his life decisions. So, yeah, uh, the conversations like that, Trefus, are... I would have them. Enjoy them. Think creatively. Think a little bit outside the box. Just just be willing that if you, if you want... If you want something, that you're paying for it also. Rogue says, what did you mean by life phase again? Uh, no problem, Rogue. Are you a child prodigy? Are you a young adult? Are you an adult? Are you middle-aged? Old? Are you venerable? Um, what, you know, you can give a specific age if you want, but I want the life phase. I want the, what is the mentality of your character? You know, does he or she look youthful? And, you know, and is setting out as a young adventurer? Or are you playing, you know, like a wizened, you know, a middle-aged or even an elderly character. There, yeah, that replies not fire. Laws, or maybe you're a half dragon and have some other race. I've seen that done in Critical Role and a few other five E streams. Yeah, homebrew away. Derek says, uh, just know sometimes the deep end is scary and missing chunks of sunlight. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this, says Sans. Says Sans. All right, so congratulations. Um. We have, we have a, our racial features already installed. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Collapse this. I'll fix my position here in. Uh... There we go. Okay. Now we're gonna explore our class. Rogue. I was thinking of a dragonborn with mixed heritage, where it looks like a gold dragonborn, but it's breathing and resisting ice. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Rogue. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to review it and go over it. So we're a fourth level character. Boom. Yes, this is a chart with a bunch of words on it. If you don't know what they mean, don't worry about it. We're going to take this one step at a time as we're building our level four character. With Disguise and Forgery, it would seem cons by impersonation are possible. White-collar theft, so to speak? Possibly. Um, if we want to take... Yes, she runs a sleight of hand cons on the street, you know, on a street corner. Um, maybe she doesn't do that literally. Maybe instead we just see that, okay, so this ability is allowing us to kind of lock in an operating area. Like a type of con in an operating area. And so, in that case, Zolar P, if we go with the theme and not a literal translation of that, then yes, maybe she chooses to um, maybe she chooses to engage people that way, and she focuses on white collar crime. King says alter self could be treated as a protection from elements if your enemies are genre savvy. Oh, yeah, that would be very interesting, wouldn't it? Laws on Me says, who are we building today? And uh, do I ever stream gameplay, or do you only focus on character creation? Um, Laws, uh, after coming back from my vacation, yesterday we had a session zero of gameplay. Every Tuesday, I will be streaming a game with uh, people the, from the community over here. The other days, we will continue to have our workshops, our discussions, teaching new players, Q&A, that sort of stuff. 
Uh, King says, personally, I'd just go, uh, I'd go with war paint to help dragon aesthetic. Otherwise, you got to rely on jeans kicking in 15 years later. All right, here we go. As a rogue, we're going to get the following stuff. We get something called hit die. As you can see, we are a 1d8 hit die class. Your hit die reflect your natural ability to recover uh, from battle, like your hit points, in between battles. Kind of like as you rest, you can catch your breath. Every level, you get an additional hit die of the class in which you're leveling. Therefore, hey, we have 4d8 hit die as our character. We're not going to worry about our hit points just yet, because that relies on our ability scores, and we, we haven't generated those yet. And I'm not worried about generating them yet either. Dusty Bill! Ah! Run! Follow me! <laughs> Thanks for coming along with us. All right, now we're going to get some proficiencies. We are proficient with light armor. All right, we gotta we gotta be all loosey goosey and flexible as a thief. Uh, though, uh, Cookie, if you're still out there and haven't fallen asleep to the uh, the 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 sound of my voice, um, we can discuss feats in a little bit here, uh, because we can dis we can go over. Well, how can a rogue actually wear heavier armor? Well, a feat can help with that. Uh, Law says every Tuesday, got it. Well, quite excited. Uh, yes, we, we hope to see you from 11 to 3, Laws. Uh, Sandsfire, she could use her sleight of hand to take something that could further uh, the authenticity of the person in question. Yes, indeed. A badge or, uh, you know, some sort of sigil. Uh, King, Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Come see the monster dungeon event of the season. You'll pay for the whole seat, but you'll only use the edge. Derek says, I'm looking forward to seeing what the players bring to the table. Heard the concepts, but want to see more. Fluffy responds, session zero. Still just character creation, but we promise to actually play the characters soon. Ninbins, I think the reason why there was a half-dragon, half-human character in Critical Role is because she was a dragon ancestry sorcerer. Ah. Uh, I think Thief or Arcane Trickster are going to be her best bets. Law says, Ninbins, true, but I think uh, that could be played with for a bit. Cookie, uh, I don't have a feat fetish, but I'm into feats. <laughs> uh, hey, Deagle, so good to see you again. Uh, were we just talking about the dulcet tones of Maddie Morg's voice? Maui. So you have a feetish. <laughs> nice, nice one. Oh, yeah, Rogue, if you're here, feel free to collaborate with uh, Derek and Fluffy or anyone else uh, who's uh, a part of the PC cast. <laughs> All right, we are proficient with uh, some different weapons. We are proficient with simple weapons. That is a category that encompasses many weapons. Simple hand crossbows. Long and short swords and rapiers. We are also proficient with thieves' tools. In other words, we can pick locks, maybe disable traps. Uh, we might have some fun little, um, some fun little like James Bond toys that we could play around with. Um, it's up to your DM and you to decide what kind of tools you have and how how they can be used. Serena, 9876, thank you for coming along the journey with us. <laughs> oh, you're so nice to the bot.
Okay, now, this is where we can do a little bit of, uh, of role-playing using our background or what we know or conceptualize about the character. We are going to get to choose four skills. Well, all right, so the list... Oh. Deagle, thank you very much. You've noticed us. <laughs> I'll get my head out of the way. Ready? Ooh. Run, Serena, follow me. We're going to get to choose four skills for her. Now, determining skills can be done in a couple different ways. Sometimes players just get together and say, eh, does anyone have... Rogue, thank you. Lend me your power. Some people say, look, does anyone have acrobatics? No. Okay, I'll take acrobatics. That's fine. You can collaborate that way. For the exercises we do here, though, um, and I open this up to you all in chat, which of the skills would you want her to have as a rogue? And we can base this on her personality, especially. Um, or, you know, her background or even the fact she's a dragonborn in some way. For instance, I have a joke for every occasion, especially occasions where humor is inappropriate. Could that perhaps make, um, would that mean that she's good at performance? I keep multiple holy symbols on me and invoke whatever deity might come in useful in any given moment. Uh, could that be, well, she already has deception and sleight of hand by virtue of being a charlatan. But could that perhaps give her, um... That could also be performance, right? She may not have knowledge religion, but uh, she might be able to perform or even persuade. Her ideal is friendship. Material goods come and go. Bonds of friendship last forever. Is that also, is that something here? I owe everything to my mentor, a horrible person who's probably rotting in, a, in jail somewhere. Okay. Uh, let's come up with some story. Is that because she, uh, is she good at investigation and she pieced together what was happening and she, she set up this plan that got her mentor put in jail? Um, or did, uh, or because she's a rogue, I mean, just looking at her class, uh, do we want to make her a sneaky rogue or if not sneaky? Cause she seems to be a lot more of a face rogue, right? She wants to, she wants to pull the cons and whatnot. Um, you know, is she beefy? Is she dexterous? Is she a face rogue? Um, and then I hate to admit it, and I will hate myself for it, but I'll run and preserve my own hide if the going gets tough. Well, that could also invoke perhaps um, a proficiency in stealth, right? So she can hide or blend in. Um, that could uh, even invoke acrobatics or athletics as a way to bug out of there if she needs to. Oh, yes, thank you, Deagle. You're waiting for the end of the staycation. Well, it is over, and, and the channel's been revamped, and we're doing a lot of fun stuff. Uh, King wants uh, to have her have seduction. Rogue Infinity says deception. King replies the same thing. Ninbins, definitely. I had a Yonti pureblood die in my game this last weekend. Because she was trying to save the dragon, and because died to save, I gave her the chance to have her draconic ancestry magically activated by the dragon, and she said yes. When she came to, she was a sorcerer. She had lost her leg, which meant her rogue skills would be useless while she was trying to adjust. I might gift her a level or two of rogue down the line. Okay. I like that, Ninbins. And I also like that give and take. You know, it, it's a punishment and a reward kind of a system. Sandsfire, stealth for running away from tough situations. So, uh, well, we have, we have deception already for, uh, because we are a charlatan. So, uh, Sans, we can give her stealth. Uh, athletics for running. Okay, so stealth, athletics. A permafrost icicle leg. That would be very interesting. Hey, Cake Bass, good to see you. All right, well, we get two more. We get to choose four skills from the list. Right? We already have deception and sleight of hand. So let's give her athletics and stealth. Would we like to give her performance? 
I mean, if you're if you're gonna pull off a con, you might need to perform as well as deceive. Um, that would be a recommendation. But look, this isn't my character. This is our character that we're building together. We have acrobatics, athletics, deception, insight, intimidation, investigation. That's like putting clues together. Uh, perception. You know, so she's on the lookout. Uh, good at hearing, etc. Performance. Persuasion, sleight of hand, and stealth. I see this dragonborn is essentially a coward. Not only will she run from danger, her mentor's in prison. Suppose there was a heist or a scam and she cracked and got caught because of it. Yeah, she could be a liability. And in some way, it'd be weird to have, like, a thief redemption story, but it's not redemption to necessarily be good, it's to be a better thief. Performance for the false identity. All right, we get one more. I like to think at some point she would have gained some actual knowledge in religion. Uh, that could be, and you know what, Orc? You did bring up a good point. If we, if we were really wanting to play this up, we could approach our DM and say, look... It's not on the list, but I really want to approach this. Uh, I want to. I want to approach this religion scam. Um, can I take religion instead of the default skills that Rogue includes? And you know what? If if Orc came to me and and said this, and you know, I would be interested in seeing how you want to pull this off. And in that case, you know what? Maybe the fourth actually would be put into religion. Usually we do things by the book here, but look, if you guys have really solid ideas and it's a learning moment for us all and it gets us to consider things and open up lines of communication as players and DMs and whatnot, hey, let's do that. So there, these are her four skills. All right, now, your class gives you some starting equipment. We are going to start with a rapier or a short sword. Then we're going to get either a short bow and a quiver of 20 arrows or a short sword. So if we want, we can have two short swords. Are we, you know, are we blade? Do we want to kind of mix it around? What would we like to do in that case? Um, a burglar's pack, a dungeoneer's pack, or an explorer's pack. I think she's going to take the burglars because that she burgles. Leather armor, two daggers, and thieves' tools. Hi, Becky. Good morning to you. I hope your, uh, your World of Warcraft is going well. I wasn't able to pop in and say hi when you were playing last time, but I have seen you streaming World of Warcraft, and I, I hope you're having fun doing that. You think it'd be more towards a short bow? Why would that be, Sandsfire? Is that because uh, she... She might not want to get close because it would tempt her to run away? Pi agrees. Melee, not for scaredy cats. If she's further behind, she's safer from close range attacks, which means she's mentally and physically feel safer. Good observation, Cookie. All right, now, here is an interesting, uh, not a conundrum for you all, but I, I, want to, I, I want to give you an interesting thought. If we look at the two weapons that are offered, 
she gets either a rapier, which is um, a 1d8 piercing, uh, 1d8 piercing sword. It has the finesse quality. By the way, I'm going to put myself back uh, where I where I belong next to chat. Finesse means that while it is a melee weapon that traditionally uses strength, you can use your dexterity. And then you say, well, but why would we want why would we want a rapier and we can take a short sword? Yeah, it's 1d6 piercing. It's also finesse. Ah, but it is a light weapon. Meaning if we ever wanted to go two, uh, two weapon fighting, we could fight with two short swords. But you know what? Even if we don't want two weapon fighting, consider this. If you have a rapier, which is kind of like, well, it's not a fencing foil, but it, it's a longer, thinner sword, right? If she's the type of person who wants to get away from a situation or, you know, or even to do some second story work, um, in other words, you know, climb and breaking in, is a, is a small, thin blade going to be as useful a tool as a thicker short sword blade that she could use to jam in between bricks and climb up on that she could use probably to pry if she really needs to. Um, so think about it this way. Mechanically, if we wanted maximum damage per round, we'd go with a rapier because it's a higher, it's a higher die. Thematically as our character, we would probably carry a short sword because it's a lot more utilitarian if we think creatively in ways to use the short sword, aside from just hitting people with it. Yeah, a dagger is a light weapon, Trefus, if we did want to do that. Um, in that case, then, you're, you're trading off the D4 dagger for a, a, instead of a D6 short sword. Fluffy uh, says that the rapier and the short sword are basically reversed from what they should be in terms of damage. Or what? What are you? What are you referencing, Fluffy Sheep? Ninbins, I think uh, she would take a short bow over for the utility would give her. She could get a grappling arrow. Yeah, something like that. That's true. So that depends. I, it, it doesn't have to be a short sword. It could be the rapier if you want to go with it. But I wanted to throw that thought out there for you all. You're having too much fun with it. It's consuming my life. I'm not catched up. What's the character like? Well, I'm glad you're having fun. Don't let an MMORPG consume your life, Becky. Here, uh, Here's the basic stats for our character. Whoops, I put these in cantrips. These should be in... Um the weapons. Short bow is 1d6. Piercing. Short sword is 1d6. Piercing. You're having someone... Okay, uh, Fluffy Sheep says, in terms of how they work, the rapier is the lighter weapon, and rapier plus dagger is basically the only dual wielding that actually happened. Meanwhile, the heavier short sword uh, should do more damage. Yeah, I mean, because if you compare something like a Gladius to a, a Saber... Which has longer reach? Uh, what do you mean, Sans Fire? And Benz, if she's trying to be a better rogue, I think she'd try to make that transition as easy as possible by, uh, by covering some of her weaknesses with good equipment. Yeah, yeah, she has a short bow right here. Yeah, mechanically, mechanically all swords have the same reach. Rapier is the same weight as a long sword. Short sword is an arming sword like a gladius. Well, if we look, the rapier here is two pounds. The short sword is also two pounds. The long sword's weighing in at three. Hi, Norton. Good to see you. 
You must head to sleep now. I will be sure to watch the recording tomorrow. Thank you so much for the stream. You're very welcome, Cookie. And uh, that that is a very tasty emote. Nom 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 nom. Um, uh, cookie, before you go, can you give uh, can you give Norton the Knoll a cookie, please? Longsword D and D should be a two handed weapon. Well, it has the option of being a two handed weapon, as it's versatile. You get more damage if you do wield it two handed. All right, now let's go back to the classes. Go back to Rogue. There we go. There's our equipment. Now, we get something called Expertise. This means we're super good in some skills. At first level, choose two of your skill proficiencies or one of your skill proficiencies and your proficiency with Thieves tools. Your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check you make that uses either of the chosen proficiencies. At sixth level, you can choose two more of your proficiencies um, in skills or Thieves tools to gain this benefit. <laughs> hey, Cookie's busting out the, uh, the, the cookie and tea. Uh, Becky, so uh, she is a thief, but she does uh, she does she do, is also a con artist. Um, it's just a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Sans, uh, like traditionally, a rapier is longer but a thinner blade, while a short sword has a thicker but shorter blade. So if the rapier is a longer reach, she would choose that to stay at a distance. That makes sense in the mechanics of D and D. A sword's a sword. All the cookies. I'm going to be a chubby knoll. <laughs> uh, a, a fluffy knoll. Uh, Pi says, general question, maybe for another stream. If one person's character has the skills to successfully impersonate another player, can a DM handle this situation? Ha uh, handle it how? Can you, can you present the concept? Uh, like, can you put a little bit more out there? Trefus thinks that the long sword should just be a hand and a half sword. Or otherwise known as a bastard sword. Now we're going to... Okay. This specifically says thieves tools. And you know what? She is a thief. I, and she does thiefy stuff. However, because of her charlatan background and how we want to play this up, it you can request your DM, hey, instead of thieves tools... Can I, can I get uh, expertise in using my forgery kit or my disguise kit? And your DM might say yes, might say no. Um, are you know how how strong of a case are you making? How imaginative are you? You can ask ask your DM whatever you want, but can you back it up? Why do you want X, and are you willing to pay Y for it? In this case, what would we like to give her expertise in uh, in using? We can go two skills or one skill and thieves tools. Would it be sleight of hand? Because she is a sleight of hand con artist. Would it be stealth? Or might it actually be deception? Is she really strong in deception? And or Demonico, thank you. Run, Demonico! Get out of here. This character, say A, can impersonate. So a con would be to fool player B into thinking she was player C and get some advantage. So character A can impersonate. So a con would be to fool player B into thinking she was player C. Okay, I think... I think I know what you're going for, uh, Zuller Pie. It's possible, but it would take the cooperation of everyone involved and maybe a little suspension of disbelief. Or, uh, people are willing to... Um, to give up their own deduction and everyone submits to the random rolls of the dice 
to then dictate to the players what is happening instead of the other way around. All right, so you all out there, which two skills would you like her to be proficient or uh, to have expertise in? And or would you like to give her a tool proficiency and a skill instead of two skills? We're also going to get sneak attack and we are going to we're having a sneak attack of an extra 1d6 damage when we get to invoke that. Um Santa's, good evening to you. Her personality is as such. Let's see. We will get sneak attack. Uh, and, and that's that's our way as a rogue, because we tend to use lighter weapons. Um, you can really do some spike damage if you get sneak attack bonus die. Uh, I mean, you're, you're just going for kidneys at that point, if you can set it up. Becky would like deception, because it feels like the character would want to avoid combat as much as possible. In case she would get caught, She could uh, she'd have the need to get away. So we could give her expertise in uh, in deception. In that case, we still have one more skill or a tool in which she's proficient. I don't think she's skilled enough to warrant expertise with thieves' tools or even with the stealth or sleight of hand. I think she'd be better at the con, so I think she'd get expertise in religion and deception. We can do that. Are you, are you all digging what uh, Becky and Ninbins are... Uh, are, con are conceptualizing for the character. If we do that here, on this character sheet, you see this extra little circle right here? That can indicate expertise. Nice and clean. Persuasion could be interesting too. Sandfire agreed, Rogue Infinity agreed. Uh, persuasion, if she had persuasion, uh, that, that could be. But she's not trying to, she's not trying to persuade people. She's trying to trick them, or to distract them with a performance in some way to convince people uh, through that, through like you know, uh, her sleight of hand tricks or you know, kind of her winning smile. All right, excellent. We are also going to learn a secret language of thieves can't. That's a special code that rogues use between each other in order to convey information, jobs, um, you know, successes, defeats, even tell jokes or mark targets. Uh, it's it's meant to be used in the open, but no one knows what you're actually talking about because it's you know kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Oh, is you like the social characters, Becky? Fluffy would want to go with deception and performance. Um, she doesn't need to be an expert on religion just to be good enough to fool people. That's a possibility as well. Dark Wolf, so I've been drawing this character and originally was going to have her holding some cards for her con. However, with this cleric false identity, I'm thinking perhaps she goes around selling like indulgences. Oh yeah, uh, so maybe she sh she sells um, you know trinkets indulgences you know you know i'll absolve you of your sins um you know charms blessings that kind of thing and you know what uh fluffy you bring up an, an interesting point because look if we give her expertise uh by simply clicking in these buttons not only to give her um not only to give her uh uh <clears throat> proficiency derp not only to give her proficiency, but to make her an expert, these little buttons can can change her entire di uh, direction of who she is and what she does. All by a little bubble on a sheet. Isn't that interesting? 
All right, we're going to get cunning action. Starting at second level, your quick thinking and agility can allow you to move and act quickly. So we are going to get cunning action. Now, as I make these characters, for any of you who are new, I will sometimes read a little bit of a blurb of what an ability does. I may not always. And so as I'm continuing to build the character, you have to stop me and let me know if you need a further explanation of something. All right, we're going to get our roguish archetype, and we'll get to that in a second. And lastly, we're going to get our ability score improvement at level 4. We're going to worry about that when we actually start dropping ability scores in the character. Now let's go to her archetype. As a thief, you get extra abilities on top of being a rogue. Fast hands. Um, you can use a bonus action granted by your cunning action to make a, a sleight of hand check. That's pretty good. You can use your thieves tools to disarm a trap, open a lock, or take a use an object action. Then we're also going to get second story work. When you choose this archetype at third level, you gain the ability to climb faster than normal. Climbing no longer costs you extra movement. Aha! Second story work. You see our climb speed up here? Used to be 15. Now because we're really good at climbing, our climb speed goes up to 30. Uh, we also can run and uh, we also get to jump further. And the next, uh, the next bit of uh, Thief we get isn't until level 9. So this is what we have. Alright, excellent. We, uh, our, our character's really coming together. Now, we can add, let's drop the engine into our chassis that we've built. This is called the standard array. These are a set of starting scores that you can distribute as you want inside of your, uh, your ability boxes here. She has a joke for every occasion, keeps multiple holy symbols. So, I don't know, Charisma um, Charisma is probably going to be a higher stat for her, given her personality. Um, I hate to admit it, I'll preserve my own hide. So, I think she's definitely going to be a dexterity-based character for offense and defense. I think Charisma is also going to be high for her. Um... So probably something if you have a different if you have a different outlay of the scores, make sure to let me know. But what if we were to put in the 15 the 14 the Now let's put the 14 in con. Let's put the 13 in charisma. So we have the 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. Now, I'll explain why I think this is a good stat spread, and if you have a different one, you are welcome to share it. Dexterity is key for rogues, but especially given, given her cons and everything about her, this is going to be super useful for offense, defense, and for her skills. Charisma, she is a charisma rogue also. I think this is going to be important to help her pull off her cons. The constitution at 14 is going to give her not only more hit points, but as a dragonborn, uh, this is going to make your breath weapon um, harder to resist. So it actually has dual action as a dragonborn. Not only are you beefier, and she's a beefy girl. Look, she's 6'9", 250 pounds. She's got a, she's got a lot of health. Um, it's also going to help when it comes to uh, her breath weapon. Wisdom, she should have at least some kind of a positive modifier because I don't think that wisdom would be a dump stat. You know, to be insightful, you have to have some insight to be, you know, maybe to read people or to try and trick people. Uh, perception can come in handy. So she's not good at it, but she's not, you know, she's better than average at it. Um, strength. She uh, to climb to um, to climb to jump uh, to you know be a better at athletics to run and, and such. I felt that this is appropriate, and she's got muscles. 
because of uh, her being a dragonborn. And lastly, I thought her intelligence could be the dump stat because she's pro she I don't think she's really smart. Um, you know, in religion, especially if we give her the expertise here, when it comes to religion, she is focused and she'll be good at religion. She just doesn't know a lot about the world otherwise. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Sandsfire says Dex, Charisma, Int, Con, Strength. Uh, could you roll the stats now that you've uh, bought them just to imagine what they could have been? Um, if you... Yeah, uh, Int and Wiz is, uh, is book learning or street smarts. Uh, if you'd like, uh, Santa, um, you can uh, you can actually roll stats uh, in the chat. If, if you want to have some fun and see what could have been, type in exclamation point 4d6. Oh, we're off to a fantastic start. I, I mean, it's an eight. That's not bad. But yeah, uh, if you if you look Santa, look down below. Whether you're on mobile or desktop, there's a whole there's a whole list of commands for chat games and role play prompts and other good stuff for you there. All right, if we have that, let's add in our racial modifier. So that's going to bring her charisma to a 14 and her strength to a 12. Um, although Sandsfire looks like you had a, a slightly different one. You wanted con and strength to actually be lower. And if that's fine, because look, if, if we put 8 in strength, she would have average strength because of that uh, plus 2 from the racial modifier. You know, how would you want to flavor her? Well, it's up to you. <laughs> you're fine santa uh in fact um uh santa uh do something for me here i want you to type in exclamation point random planes p-l-a-i-n-s all one word exclamation point random planes P L A I N S. Yeah, Boeing, Airbus. <laughs> Deagle, so I rolled stats for a new campaign I'm starting next week over the weekend. I might have convinced the DM to never roll stats again. I think she'll be using point by or standard array. Wow, that is an interesting cast you have, Ivalon. Hmm. Uh, you, I thought you would have had enough experience by now. Uh, add points. Okay. Uh, Santa, wait about five minutes and do that command again. And you'll you'll have something fun happen. Uh, chat adventure. All right, diadems. Um, uh, diadems. I want you to type in. Uh, I as long as it's been at least a minute since Santa has typed it in, I want you to type in exclamation point random planes. Now she's also going to get a stat bump, and I think what we could do here is, uh, if we want, we could just jump the two into dexterity, or. We could bring her dex to 16, and if you're ever facing a, a, a moment where you're like, well, I can put two into one, or one into two, and you say, well, where do I want to float the one if, I, if you want to keep an even number for your dex? Well, constitution and strength have mechanics based on the score of that ability, not just the modifier. And so... You can always drop a spare ability point into 
the score of strength or the score of con. All right, Diadems, a nearing Russell. A rabbit jumping from the grass is a kobold mage. Only a 10 or greater can defeat it. You attack normally, adding a plus one modifier. It's worth uh, 125 experience if defeated. All right, Diadems, because it's prompting you to attack normally, roll exclamation point 1d20. If you are ever prompted to roll at advantage or disadvantage, you would roll exclamation point 2d20. Uh, feats and character creation, I don't mind them. Um, it, it, as long as it's uh, slotted, right? You know, if you're the variant human or if you're generating a character of an appropriate level. All right, Diadems rolls and stops on a 6 plus 1 is 7. And unfortunately, Diadems, uh, the Kobold Mage, uh, defeats you. Uh, so, you know, Ripperonis, uh, Ripperonis for Diadems, or you can press F to pay respects. Um, Diadems, uh, I think we can try and get you a raise, but you know what? We don't... Whoops. We, we don't have enough money for, like, a true resurrection. But we'll drag you to the nearest temple, and we'll try and we'll try and get you back. So, Diadems, I want you to type in exclamation point res, please. R-E-Z-P-L-Z. You're dead, but not for long. When the spell ends, you arise to find yourself as a female tabaxi barbarian. All right, so you might not have died a female tabaxi barbarian, but look, any port in a storm. Come on, Diadems, work with us. At least you're alive again, right? Okay, now that we have this... Let's put the let's just put the two points in her decks for uh, for poops and hahas. <laughs> yes, Diadems is now a uh, a cat girl. Uh, as a female Tabaxi barbarian, she's um what's her name from uh, Chrono Trigger. There you go, Sands Fire. A Null Pack jumps out. All right, you attack normally. That's exclamation point one d twenty. Now that we've generated our ability modifiers from our scores, these can bleed over into everything else on the page, right? Um, I almost forgot dexterity and intelligence are our saves here. Sans, you roll a 17, plus 2 is 19. Sans, you take out the null pack, and a mod will be giving you 125 experience points as a reward. Ah, oh, there you go, Santa. Now, that gave you some ex extra experience points to play around with as well. Saving throw is one. Athletics is going to be three. And that's because at fourth level, our, uh, our proficiency bonus is two, and we're proficient in athletics. Dexterity, our save is going to be five. Acrobatics, three. However, sleight of hand and stealth are both going to be plus five. Constitution's a 2. Our intelligence saving throw is a 1, because we're proficient in it. And religion is actually going to be a 3, because we get to add proficiency twice. Remember, uh, it, she, is, she has expertise here. Otherwise, everything else we're just going to uh, copy and paste, <laughs> then minus 1. Uh, wisdom's going to be 1 all the way down the line. Nice and easy. Charisma, uh, 2 for the things in which we're not proficient. And then it's going to be four for performance and six for deception. Well, don't forget that the expertise is uh, the bonus from that is going to grow as your proficiency or as your, um, yeah, your proficiency bonus does. Uh, Serena, the, the chat adventure, you can see the instructions down below, or Ivalon or someone else might be able to help you out with it.
Okay, passive perception is going to be 11. That is your perception modifier, or your bonus, or plus a plus 10. That's your natural awareness of what's happening around you. It reduces a lot of extra dice rolls in the game. It's nice. All right, let's figure out our hit points. At first level, you get your maximum hit die in hit points. So you're, we're a D8 hit die class. At level one, we get eight. For levels beyond one, unless your DM says otherwise, you get half plus one of your hit die. So in other words, for the next three levels, because we're level four, right? Eight is our one, and then we have the other three levels. We have three levels times five hit points. Half of eight is four, plus one is five. But wait, there's more. For every level, therefore all four of our levels, you get bonus hit points equal to your constitution modifier. There we go. This is this is as math heavy as we're going to get, right? So we have 8 plus 15, so we have 16 plus 15, and that's going to make sure that we, uh, we have 31 hit points as a rogue. Now, our dexterity. Uh, initiative is a dexterity check. Think almost like a skill. Initiative is almost like a skill. Our initiative is going to be a plus 3 because that's what our dex modifier is. Don't forget, if you're a bard and have jack-of-all-trades, or um, if you are a fighter that has... Um, uh, if you're the champion fighter that gives a bonus to dexterity checks, you get to add that to your, your uh, initiative also. Armor class. We're wearing leather armor. That starts us off at 11, plus dexterity bonus. Well, we add in our, our dex bonus of 3, and bada-boom, we're sitting at a, a 14 armor class. Zero dark vision. Uh, Dragonborn do not get it. And by the way, she's no longer a pile of stats. She deserves a name. Um, to attack with all of these weapons which can use dexterity, well, we're proficient, meaning that we get our proficiency bonus, then our ability mod in order to determine uh, our, our modifier to hit. In other words, it's going to be a plus five down the board for both our melee and our range, because these are all dex-based. You also get bonus damage with weapons based on the modifier of the ability you're using to wield it. As we're using Dexterity, all of these are going to have a bonus damage of plus three. I hope that makes sense for you all. Don't forget, when, you're, when your proficiency bonus goes up at fifth level, your attack goes up, but your damage would not. If you were to increase your Dexterity again, then both your attack and your damage would go up. We don't have to worry about spells. Uh, she's a rogue character. And... Aside from a name, we are we're pretty much finished with this character. Excellent. I hope this was fun for you. I'm going to take like a 10 minute break to get a snack, something to drink, turn on a fan because it's getting a little warm. And then we're going to do a second character randomly again as we're building a party of five characters for the week to put through some kind of an adventure that we're running together. Uh, as a like a, a community chat not like to actually go on roll 20 but to conceptualize to go through the steps of making a campaign building it having these thought experiments hi dark initiative well uh in a sense we're all playing right now i do run a game on tuesdays uh but the every other day in the week that i broadcast uh we build characters together uh we're, we're kind of going on an adventure together including me with you all as we figure out who, who's what. Um, we're, we're seeing some, we're seeing some names here. Um, nice, Becky. You got 75 experience uh, from defeating the Null Pack. So are things like Ornifex and Charrier the, the names you're submitting? I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and think about it. Um, I am going to, uh, I, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a short rest here. I'm gonna take about a ten minute break, and I'll come back, and we can throw a name on her and get character number two underway. Okay.